Hi, it's Tom Panos here from News Limited, and I'm so pumped today because this is the interview I've been waiting for quite a while to do. It's the interview with Matt LaHood, who is one of the partners of McGrath's, but more importantly, the director of sales of the whole group. The reason I've been looking forward to this interview is that it's a topic and a subject that very few people want to actually discuss, and that is, how do you run one of the biggest and most successful teams in the country in sales, having people that can write a couple of million dollars a year, how do you manage these kinds of people? Matt LaHood does this in his day-to-day -day job. He looks across all the divisions and we're going to talk about exactly what he does. Welcome, Matt LaHood. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, for having me on. Mate, it's a pleasure. Uh, Matt, a lot of people know about you, but can I get the 60 second version of your real estate career? Sure, 60 seconds in a nutshell. I started real estate when I was 17. Yeah. Uh, straight out of school, literally straight into real estate. Uh, went straight into junior property management. So those days was called like a letting clerk. So went straight into that role and then did that for two years. That gave me a real good grounding on how to sort of softly work with negotiating between landlords and tenants and um, if you're fixing any issues up. So it gave me a real good solid grounding. Then straight away in two years I found out I really wanted to sell. So I went straight into selling real estate at 19 and here I am uh, 23 years later. Um, one of the things that people probably know you more of because you're doing a lot of speaking and training is the fact that for most of your real estate life you were writing over a million dollars a year in GCI. Um, that was less common back then, yep. more common now but still it's exceptional today. So this one million dollars a year that you're writing, how useful is it in the job that you do right now? Oh, absolutely. I think, Tom, the, I wouldn't be doing the job for sure if I hadn't had that grounding because the type of um, salespeople I'm dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, they, the, one of the key um, skills that I need is, is experience and I need the agents to understand, the salespeople to understand that I have those skills to transfer to them. And there's not a situation, I'm, I'm probably safe to say that in 23 or 4 years I haven't encountered at an auction or during a negotiation, listing presentation, um, any type of presentation that we're doing out there in the marketplace that, that I haven't encountered. So you're always learning every day, but the situations, there's always something I can fall back on to draw to be able to help our team with. Okay, so there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of salespeople that work under the McGrath brand. Um, I'm curious, your job as Director of Sales, yep. what are your main three activities that you do? <coughs> okay, I've got uh, a range of, got a uh, main three activities. One would be to, I speak to my managers uh, three times a day, every single day, and uh, without fail, six days of the week. So that's main part is to find out what's happening in their life in terms of their day-to-day -day activities with their individual sales agents. I also work with um, the top group in, in the company in terms of managing, just clearing, uh, as I was saying to you before, um, I'm known as uh, the electric eel amongst the team. It's a bit of a funny sort of thing because I'm the one that, that clears the crap for them. That, and that's, what that's really where my space is. So. One, I look after uh, the actual sales managers day to day, three times a day, speak to them. Two, I work with the top flight um, sales agents in the group to help them really build their business up. But I do have a walk around in every single office that I'm in and I speak to every single sales agent wherever I am, am during that day. So they're my three moving parts um, of the business is to connect with every single sales manager, um, work, work closely with the teams of the top um, agents and then individual agents be literally walk around the offices wherever I am because I could be in one of eight offices in every single day um, of the company owned offices that I look after on, on during that week period. The thing that fascinates me about <coughs> you Matt and the work you do is that there is you're very unique in the sense that there are not many people in real estate in Australia that essentially have the responsibility of leading, managing, electric eeling, people that write $1 million, $2 million, 
But in addition to that, having the normal agents, and when I say normal, that most agents don't write that money. Most agents, in fact, struggle. I mean, the IBIS numbers show that the average agent across Australia is making $60,000 a year, which is writing less than 200 GCI. How do you, how do you manage someone writing a seven-figure GCI versus someone who is struggling? How do you okay. do them? It's a great question and it's a simple answer, Tom. The, the first bit where sales managers and director of sales, I think, have missed the mark a lot in our industry is uh, they treat their teams like the teams are working for them. Well, I reversed, I've got a reverse view. I'm working for the sales team. So to me, they're people. I don't have a price tag on them. Um, but what I do know is somebody that's struggling, I do have the ability to be able to turn their business around. Somebody that's writing, let's say, pick a line in the sand, half a million dollars. I also do know how to get that person up to a million dollars. And that person that's writing a million, I know how to get them to two million. So to me, it's all about people. It's right. not, I don't pigeonhole a certain um, performer. But where I've found my, a lot of my value has been used is, is that uh, I'm getting workflow between teams right. Because yeah. I have an envious job. Uh, Tommy, I'm able to go around the group yeah. and um, pick the eyes out of who's really going really well and then take those ideas and transfer them to other parts of the business. It could be somebody that's just moved their business, you know, doubled their business in the last 12 months. I can take that skill to another part of Australia, yeah. uh, to, for argument's sake, take it from your New South Wales to Queensland and use that same skill and, use, and then maybe link those two people together. So I could say, you know, like Mary has had a problem and we've doubled her business and now we've given that to uh, Monica who now has that skill and they're now talking to each other and mentoring. So it's about linking and cross-linking everyone together. But in summarising what I've just said, it's all about I work for the agents. The agents don't work for me. Right. Um, and I think once you can understand in yourself as a sales manager, um, I think if you look around the world at the moment, it's fair to say that dictatorships are finished. Yeah. If you look at all the countries where all the dictators have been yeah. removed, um, I look at that as and that's people don't want to be dictated to. I don't dictate to my team. I coach and mentor, and I find that that gets the best results when I coach and mentor. Okay, uh, Matt. I, one of the one of the things that I see that sales managers struggle is that a lot of the times the people that they're trying to influence make more money than themselves. Big hitters. Yep. Um, how, do you, how do you handle that issue? There, I mean, there are people in your group that write in the millions and millions. Yeah. Do, how do you sit there and say to them, <laughs> mate, do this, you're doing this wrong, when they're thinking, what are you talking about? Look at me, I'm, I'm a star, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm the man. I think, um, look, it's a, good, it's a very good question and it's, it's a challenge that you have out there and I'm glad to say the more people making a more, lot more money than me is fantastic because that means in one small part I've had something to do with their business. I'm excited for them, I'm genuinely excited. If I see everyone making a, um, a large amount of money but also having a good life too in the process, yeah. which I've been lucky to be able to do, I think I've been able to get the work life the whole thing right. You know, I've got a stable home environment. I've got um, great colleagues that work with me in terms of my micro team as well. I've had the same people for a long time. Um, I've had only in, in 22 years time, I've had like three personal assistants, which I think is formidable. Um, and I really work at my own team. Yeah. Um, and again, I work for them. And that's the reverse. So having people making a lot more money than the salesman, that, that should be a compliment to you. That's how I look at it. It's a compliment because a lot of those people that I've helped on the way through, there's another one of our um, salespeople downstairs coming up to me uh, just this morning saying, I really appreciate your, your faith you had in me when I was failing, you know, like two years ago. And um, he's going to have his best uh, month and his best year ever. Now, to me, um, you can't buy that. No. No one can pay me to receive that accolade. I go home and I think, you know what, doesn't matter what happens in my world, um, that's what I get up every day for. When people say, you made a difference, yeah. and now my family can do this, and I can hire a PA, and I can buy a new house, and yeah. Matt, you're known, and the company's known, 
as having a world-class culture. Yep. That the personality of the business is energetic. Yep. It's a great place to be part of. You see people being pumped about it. Yep. What are the things that you think you do and the business does to create a world-class culture? Okay, well, um, John is, is high on, he's is, is very high, ethics are very high and the morals are very high in this company. So it all starts there. Let's say, let's just use that as the benchmark. Then my, I'm charged with taking that down line. So um, I, in my 22 years of selling, I I'm honestly can sit here and say, I can't remember having a complaint from a vendor or a buyer. I really put myself out there and busted my backside to over-service the vendor, over-service the buyer. So, I'm um, understanding of that's what we're actually doing, tenants, landlords, doesn't matter. Whoever comes in touch with our brand, yeah. um, whether they're a tenant, a landlord, a, a tradesperson, anyone, they've got to have the same McGrath experience. So that's, that's the culture we, we, we uh, drive into the team when they're out in the marketplace. However, um, I think one of the biggest things, if I, if, to really answer that question, wholeheartedly that I do when there's an issue that ever occurs within a sales team it could be two people running on the same listing or the same buyer the culture that I've created is it do, that doesn't wait in my world anything like that gets resolved in within half an hour of it happening so my view is I'll let the salespeople go and try and work it out first before I get involved because they know if I get involved it'll be a it'll seem I'll just call whatever it is and the decision will be final right. so strong leadership is absolute paramount um, I've drilled that in right across the entire group that I look after that we won't be putting up with any, I call it guerrilla behaviour if I suppose is that, there won't be anyone running interference with anyone else's business because we're all working for the, the client. The customer's always right first. Yeah. The client's interest are in the best interest. It's not about the salespeople's interest. Right. And once they understand that, and they, they unlock that, and the great salespeople unlock that, they'll all have common traits that their customers always comes first. Of course, it's the customers that, that get us to where we need, and the clients get us to where we need to go to. Um, so having an argument amongst agents, those types of things that create bad culture, I'll arrest that within the first 15 to 20 minutes, doesn't matter where I am in Australia. Um, if it gets to me, I'll, I'll solve that problem within the first 15 minutes of it reaching me. So that's one big strong thing because cultures being eroded, um, uh, you know, could be that guerrilla behaviour being able to let go and no one arresting it, no one talking to a high achiever because, you know, I don't want to upset Harry because he writes X dollars. Well, in my world, it doesn't exist. 